morning. Um, we're going to talk a bit on technological hygiene, what does it mean, uh, what's the purpose of hygiene in cheese making, and uh, what is for me the most important uh, part of the hygiene process in the dairy, which is not brushing the joints with a, a toothbrush or stuff like that, spending time doing that. Um, there is, uh, most of the time, there is a, kind, a type of hygiene that everybody forgot or is not really aware on it, and this is the technological hygiene. So just the hygiene, what's the final purpose? Um, now that the cheese became a commercial product, with centralizing the production and all the production that was very rural with the pharmacy cheese makers, moved and um, all the products are going now to be distributed in urban areas with um, a direct sales to a much bigger uh, group of consumers. There is um, a need of controlling the quality, the quality of the product in order to make good product and also to secure the customers, the consumers' um, health. So the purpose of cleaning and sanitation is uh, in order to process this kind of high quality, um, healthy product, dairy product, we need to have a definite number of rules that needs to be applied in the dairies. So the first one is to start with a high quality ma raw material. I think um, Marie-Christine and uh, a lot of different presenters yesterday, you did uh, talk about it as well. Uh, well. You will never be able to control the food safety in the dairy if you have no control on the raw material that you have. The milk is the uh, CCP number one, the quality of the milk, dedicated for pasteurization of our raw, cheese, uh, raw milk cheese production. Doesn't make any difference for me. It's not because you pasteurize the milk later on so that you can consider to have a lower quality of, uh, lower quality of milk. And second part is to clean and eventually sanitize the equipment in direct contact with the milk and the cheese. Ensure a good atmosphere hygiene a dairy with a controlled ambience in cheese making is going to secure, promote, um, establish the right atmosphere for cheese production, cheese aging, and also creating an, an ecosystem in the dairy that's going to protect your cheese. So I always consider that the best tools that we have to control food safety in the cheese are the positive bugs that we, that we have in cheese making. Um, staff hygiene is very important as well. And the last one, the respect procedures, technical parameters for the production of the product. You can, be, you can have very good milk, very good staff, good equipment, but if you don't know what you are doing in the vat, everything doesn't, fall, doesn't work, everything falls apart. So the lack of respect of hygiene will lead to alteration of the product, so taste, smell, texture, aspect, shelf life, and potentially intoxication of the uh, customer. So hygiene is, for me, first an economical target. You need to respect hygiene in order to produce cheese that you will be able to sell then after we are going to control in parallel if this cheese is not poisonous. Technological hygiene. So in food industry, we are going to consider for most of the time the processors are considering various type of hygiene. So the first one is personal, the staff hygiene, having the boots and changing clothes, wearing uh, hair nets, washing hands, to all this hygiene related to the staff. Equipment, equipment hygiene, all the equipment in contact with the milk, all the cheese must be clean and eventually sanitized. I used to say eventually because sanitation and cleaning is completely different. It's two, um, two techniques that permit to increase the food safety, but you can sanitize <coughs> I'm not going to say it. You can sanitize a dirty equipment, it will be still be dirty at the end. So clean first <coughs> and sanitize if you need after. Um, hygiene of the, uh, the berries, so the premise. Cleaning of the floor, the walls, joints, uh, roof, 
uh, depending on your HACCP procedure, your, uh, your own perception of uh, the frequency. Frequency of cleaning is up to your own responsibility. You decide when you need to clean and disinfect. If there is no problem in the final cheese, it's fine. It means that your, uh, your system works. If you have problems, it means your system doesn't work. But it's not up to me to tell you that you should clean the wall or the roof every day. Raw material hygiene, so microbiological quality of primary material. Mainly the first one is the milk, but never forget the salt, starters, rennet, spice, everything that you add into the, into the milk to make cheese. And again, uh, low TBC is not a sign of quality. Um, so the terms quality payment should be moved into quantity payment. It's not quality sign. Um, in many cases, there is two major uh, hygienes that are not really um, identified and concentrated. It's the first one, the behavior hygiene. How do you make the cheese? And this is often related to the organization of the, the dairy, the layout of the dairy. If you have to go from uh, A to C to E, coming back to B in your dairy, without any clear flow of the staff, product, clean material, dirty material, everything, all the flow of well, everything, materials, equipment, staff, must be controlled in order to limit the cross-contamination. It's difficult to reorganize that when we have an existing dairy that has been built 20 or 30, 50 years ago without considering this kind of issues. So it's something that you have to keep in mind when you plan to design a new dairy, or when you are facing a lot of issues. Uh, reorganizing the dairy, it's well one of the last uh, possibility that we have, but sometimes it's necessary, there is no other choice. And the last hygiene, it's related to what happened in the vat. I have a fantastic example uh, about this. <coughs> We've been uh, last week in uh, Salers production. They are milking outside. They are using wooden vat, no starters cleaning the uh, wooden vat with whey, no sanitizers, nothing, but they know what happens in the vat. They understand their product, they understand the color of the whey, the texture of the cheese, the, the way they make the cheese, and knowing what happens in the vat is much more important than spending ages brushing the floor. I don't say that, don't brush the floor. But first, try to understand what's going on in the vat, how do you make the cheese, then after, concentrates on all the periphery um, parameters to help you controlling this quality. <coughs> Food safety, when we have an issue in a dairy, can be pathogenic or spoilage agent, I don't recall blue molds, pseudomonas, or listeria, coliforms, uh, staph, and so on. Um, there is two issues that we need to control. First, the contamination. Where does this contaminant come from? Second parameter is why does this agent is able to develop on the cheese? So the first contamination point, it's very important, and it's going to be controlled by the initial hygiene that we've been talking about. Equipment, raw material, washing the hands, washing the equipment and the walls and so on. This is going to be controlling the contamination points, the entry source of the agent in your milk or in your cheese. That's the first stage of controlling food safety. Second stage is if the bacteria, yeast or mold is still able to come on my product, what can I do to limit the development on the cheese? Um, I'm pretty convinced that <coughs> stage number one, just cleaning and so on, doesn't work uh, because we cannot be 100% sure every day, all the time, that we are controlling all the contamination source. It's not possible. So the zero risk doesn't exist. 
So we have to keep in mind, yes, I'm trying to control and resource, but I need to control as well to focus on how can I limit this development if it happens. This is the stage number two, controlled by the technological engine. So during the process, how can we control the development of the staff, the E. coli, Staphylococcus, and so on? Just, just a small, a small bracket on that. There is four, five bugs that are a bit annoying in cheese making. There is a few thousand orders that are either we don't know what to do, or they are very positive, interesting. And if the those four bugs were so important in terms of uh, frequency, in terms of outbreaks, well, first I wouldn't have enough time to come discuss and having a glass of wine with uh, friends. Uh, spending those two days, I should run from there is to there is to there is to try to fix stuff, E. coli, and so on. It happens once, twice a year, maximum. So it's not uh, a major uh, part of my activity, but it exists. So technological parameter, the first one is acidification profile. According to target, do we look for rapid or slow acidification? In here, we are going to consider that a slow vat, a slow make, is dangerous, maybe, but in this case, I'm going to say goodbye to lactic cheese making, soft cheese, soft cheese technology, bamon type of cheese. The bamon, do you know this one? The one that is wrapped in chestnut leaves? Takes five days to go down the pH from 6.6 six to 5.2. Takes five days, about. So there is no slower make than this one. So, and slow make, heated at 36 degrees, high temperature, it's a very moist cheese, and there is no acidification. So the more we go, the more we decrease the technical tools that we have to control the quality of this product. The only one that we have is a perfect raw milk quality. There is no other way of controlling this type of cheese. Slow make. So if we decide to make faster acidification to control the food safety of this product, to have a better control, the texture is changing, aroma is changing, we don't make the same cheese. So what do we want? Make this cheese and find a way to protect this cheese, or we just em eliminate this cheese from the history and the heritage that we have in France. So acidification profile, it's a very important, uh, I would call it CCP number one, pasteurization and so on, I'm not really agree, but CCP number one for me would be recording pH or acidity evolution at various stage of the make. Uh, cheddar is faster than Tom de Savoie, that's faster than Robochon, that's faster than Banon. So every family of cheese will have its own target. And we need to understand that this cheese, it's not because I'm checking the pH at renating and at molding or demolding, that the job is finished. What's going on after, during the aging process? It's uh, the main reason why uh, about the listeria in soft cheese with the 60 days rules. In this type of cheese, the pH go down during 24, 48 hours, stabilize, then start to go up. So the listeria that's quite acid sensitive do not really develop in the early stage of the make, but after it's open bar. 48 hours after, the pH start to go up, Listeria is able now to develop. So you need to understand the acid evolution pH profile of your cheese during the make, but also during the aging. Is it stable? Does it carry on acidifying, or does it start to go up? And how high does it go up? Type, type of starters and dosage, do we use um, DVIs, bulk, frozen. <coughs> Classic example, uh, mastitis with Staph aureus in the milk. The Staph aureus is already in the order, is used to be in this liquid, hot, full of food media. So this Staph aureus don't have any latent phase. As soon as it leaves the order, staff start to multiply, 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 instantly because it's used to the food, to the product where it is. When you have DVI starters, 
we have a longer, much longer latent phase because the starters, the powder starters, have been freeze dried. So they take time to rehydrate first and start to wake up to organize, see if there is some food, no antibiotics, or no uh, product that can prevent their development. Then after this observation phase, they start to multiply. So we have a slow start of the starters, and during this time, the staph aureus increase much faster. So in case of mastitis, I would not recommend use of DVI starters, unless you wake the starters before, two hours before, adding into the milk in order to bring uh, starters into the milk that are already in the starting blocks, ready to go. Temperature. Um, temperature will have a very important impact on the bacteria development. <coughs> but temperature is first related to the technology of the product. And sometimes we cannot play too much with that. We can say that, well, Listeria is going to develop less or more at this temperature. Um, at 4 degrees, Listeria has a much better uh, capacity of surviving and developing than lactic acid bacteria. So is it still a good idea to store the milk at 4 degrees? I don't know. I don't know. I'm not sure at all. <coughs> Duration of maturing the milk, renating, the longer you acidify. So this is technical parameters that you need to record in order to understand acid evolution that will have a direct impact on your uh, food safety. We have protecting effect from the ecosystem, so it has been developed already a lot uh, yesterday. So protection to limit development of potentially pathogenic bacteria during cheese processing, so respect of sanitary regulation, and protection to avoid microbial misbalance, responsible of sensorial quality uh, change. Like bitterness, why my cheese start to be bitter? I have a, a balance problem in the bacteria in my cheese. So why an ecosystem can have protective action to have living aspect, competition, food, uh, occupying the territory, and non-living aspect, so either by the product that they, for the metabolite that they release, or by uh, oxygen modification, redox as well. Not expanding too much, because you already have a lot of information on this. The elements of bioprotection, so potentially inhibiting microbial metabolites, we still need to learn, learn, learn a lot on that. Um, I'm not sure that we have yet the right magic powder to add into the milk or into the cheese that's going to kill the listeria. There are various companies that uh, are supplying this kind of product, anti-listeria, so either it can be phage or it can be other bacteria. I'm not yet convinced that those products are efficient. So if you have some information on that, I would be happy to, to hear more about it. But those are the various molecules that can be produced and can help uh, stabilizing the, or destroying uh, listeria development or others. Uh, competition for substrate, food, physical product, and chemical modification of environment and uh, every cellular density that's going to limit either the contamination or the development. Just a rapid studies that don't want to overlap uh, Marie Christine's presentation yesterday, but just to show that the milk is able to auto protect itself against Staph aureus. We have some milk that present <coughs> natural inhibition uh, potential against Staph aureus. Has been uh, this type of milk would be really interesting to produce banu cheese would be ideal. Targets. We need to develop methods permitting cheesemakers to know their make. <coughs> we need uh, all the research and labs and scientists to provide us with a mini kit, a mini tool to tell us 
is my milk having any beating potential or not. Um, I would see this based on the antibiotic test. You have a small tubes, you put your milk in, you incubate it for a couple of hours, and it tells you, well, my milk is able to inhibit listeria development or not, or staff. Is it possible or not? I have no idea, but I just wait for having this kind of tools to understand much more on the field what on site we can do because it's good to have research studies, but on the field in front of the cheese vat, what can I do? And we need much more relationship and uh, transmission of all those informations down to the field. Uh, how can we help the cheesemakers to understand their acidifying potential, mastitis, lactofermentation, repartition in total bacteria counts? So the relative index that Mike Hessin presented yesterday is going to be a very interesting tool to install to understand much more the family in the milk that we have and not the total count. Uh, Favour inhibiting potential of unpasteurized milk using maturation of milk prior renting, is it a way to increase the quality and the inhibiting potential just to permit your milk to develop its own ecosystem by storing the milk at warmer temperature, leaving the bacteria, the indigenous bacteria in the milk developing? Is it a way to go? Select cheese technologies according to type of milk. That's very easy to say on the paper. So one day you receive uh, mastitis milk, you are going to make this type of cheese, the other day you make another type of cheese. So on the paper it's really easy to say, but commercially speaking, uh, or on production, how do you organize, how do you manage? Can you afford to have a pasteurization, uh, pasteurized line of product and raw milk product? How do you organize? And even more complicated, how do you know instantly that your milk needs to be pasteurized or not? There is no rapid um, test that can tell you in 10 minutes. I have 10 minutes to make the decision maximum, so I need the information in 10 minutes. I need to pasteurize or I can produce raw meat cheese. Um, and that optimize use of blood uh, in the dairy. Uh, there is no starter supplier in here? No? Yeah? The recommended dosage are always way too high. It's, I've been working for starter producers as well. Usually the recommended dosage are way too high. Uh, <clears throat> and we cover everything. So I don't want older artisan cheese to make a Danisco terroir cheese or a Hansen's terroir cheese or Sacco terroir cheese. It's technological tools. So they are here to help you to make the cheese. But they shouldn't overlap, cover, destroy, or uh, uh, fraud your starters that you have, your indigenous starters that you have in your milk. So how can we play using those tools to help us making the cheese? It's really necessary. But how can we prevent this um, homogenization of the production of cheese in, in, in the world? Limit uh, destruction and modification of microbial ecosystems by changing method of cleaning. Do we need still to use chlorine, quart, uh, iodine, all those sanitizers that are first very expensive, ugly, that smells a lot, and that are destroying the best way that you have to protect your cheese, meaning the bugs, the good ones, the biofilm of good ones. And I think you said yesterday that we have uh, some evolution of listeria that start to present quart resistance. It's going to be really difficult in a couple of years if it goes the same with chlorine, with other products. So can we anticipate and not facing the same problem that we have with the antibiotics resistant bugs? And transfer to the cheesemakers. How to use the recordings? Europe regulation says you must record. You must keep records. Of what? Doesn't say. So it's up to you to record what 
you think is important. Personally, I don't see any interest of every day writing the temperature of the fridge. Yesterday was 3.5, today is 4, tomorrow is 4.2, and 3.5, yeah, it's between 3 and 6, fine. If it's less than 3, I start to record. If it's more than 6, I start to record. But what's the point of feeling every day, every day, every day the same temperature? I've been making cheese, and this was my duty of the Sunday morning, every other weekend, to fill all the papers for the coming week. <laughs> <coughs> Because we have no time. We have no time when we make cheese. It's quite an intense job. So if on top of that we have to spend an hour a day just to write the temperature on the paper, that's for me completely meaningless. On the other side, there is some technical parameters that are very important to record. Renating pH, or molding pH, or uh, demolding, sorting, day plus 10, during the aging, was the pH at this stage. This is a technical record that is going to teach you that how your cheese is behaving in your process, and it's going to please the inspector because they can see records. So everybody in this case will be able to use those records on a positive way. Thank you. Hello. I'm going to try and talk without a microphone. Is that, can you hear me at the back? Yeah? If, if I fade, just wave. And hopefully without my glasses, too. Um, I didn't really know what I was going to talk about until this morning. Um, I went from feeling that I didn't know what I could say to suddenly thinking I've got so many things to say, I don't know what I'm going to pick. Because it's been such an inspiring and such a... There's been so much information and so much to, to, to pick up on. Um, so I've got a whole series of completely unconnected. There's no flow to this. I'll just sort of pinpoint some things. And if, if I'm running over time, just give us a shout. Um, to put into context, I think certainly what, what Ivan was talking about was when I was making cheese about 25 years ago, um, it was very difficult. I was starting to try and make a mold ripened cheese after having been making fresh cheeses. Um, the, the whole climate, the whole understanding in this country at that time was very different. Um, my EHO came to me and said, you've got a big problem, there's bacteria in your cheese. <laughs> um, which worried me for a few weeks until I really thought about it and I explained to them that I'd paid quite a lot of money for them and, 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 and <laughs> They, they were there. I mean, it's, it's, I think it's happened to other people as well. It's not just a joke. And to be, to be fair to EHOs, they have to cover an awful lot of, of ground, and um, they're not all cheese experts. And back then, they certainly weren't. <clears throat> the, the, the first big issue I came across is I got this really thick, horrible black mold on my mold right and cheese. Um, and I didn't know what to do about it. And I didn't have relevant books. I didn't have anybody to go to. Well, I went to the Agricultural Dairy Advisory Service at that time, and there were some very nice people who came round who had no experience of mold ripened cheese, but they analyzed the cheese for me, and they told me that the name of the mold was Mucor. So that was great, so I could talk to the mold. Um, I had its name, <laughs> um, but I still didn't know what to do about it. So, so then they, they looked up and got some more information, said it, it exists in woodlands, um, and it comes from sort of damp, woody environments. And that was great, because I looked all around this dairy in Kent that we just moved to. We were surrounded by woodlands. So deforestation was the first option. <laughs> and I couldn't do that. It was just controlling the source of contamination wasn't an option, which sort of, it sort of backs up what Ivan's saying, is that we're looking at bacteria, molds, yeast, and saying, OK, I don't want this one, so I'm going to exclude it. But it, it, it wasn't possible. The other thing that they suggested was that I reduce the temperature of the maturing rooms and do more cleaning. So by doing all the cleaning, I was removing any potential for geotrichum or anything like that, which I'd never heard of at that time, um, removed any sort of other thing and, and, and favored the one thing that was going to come on the cheese quickest, which was mucor. By reducing the temperature of my maturing rooms, I was favoring mucor. So everything that was the instinctive thing to do at the time, and I felt these were all good things to do, 
was working against me. And all I thought was, I can't make cheese in this environment. So I didn't. I stopped. And it was 20 years later. Frankly, I had some other things to do in the meantime, which was lucky. Um, you know, driving around with Ivan and hearing what he's talking about, about technological hygiene, and clicking to the fact that actually, if we warm them up a little bit, encourage the growth of geotrichum, it would exclude the mucor. So the mucor is... is I'm not saying this is the same place, the, the, the idea was the same, moving through to a different area, different time. By allowing a proper first coating on the cheese, it excluded the mucor. The mucor was still there. So it's, it's, it's much more anecdotal version of what Ivan's saying, but just to say it, it works. It works with mold, and I knew that because I could see it. I could only hypothesize that it's also true in, with, with bacteria. Um, but I think that, that principle is, 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 I think is a huge principle of farmhouse cheese making because exclusion of bacteria, molds, and yeasts becomes more possible when you get into a factory environment. But if you're in a farm environment, you're really up against it. And you're better off not not, not being blasé and walking in with your milking clothes into the dairy and making cheese. You, you know, obviously, you do what you can, but realizing there is this other huge tool at your disposal to control anything you don't want coming in, which is the technology and the and, and understanding of the of the competitive effects. Um, a sort of follow-on from that sort of principle was I was thinking about. Um, um, Graham Kirkham, bless him, he's not here so we can talk about him, who makes lovely Lancashire cheese, but he changed out of his really small traditional dairy into a big, new, purpose-built, wonderful, technologically much better, barrier hygiene, foot baths, hand sinks, everything. It was brilliant. The cheese went down the tubes. For six months he couldn't make sellable cheese, or barely sellable cheese. Um, so what happened? Um, the, the, the first thing to think, oh, well, the bugs aren't in the room, or there's something missing, the, 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 there's something gone out of this. Um, essentially, there was, I think there was nine points, if I want that, I can't remember them all, but um, there was all sorts of little changes to his system, which had meant that this cheese that he had been making, his mother had been making for, I don't know, 30 years, and grandmother before that, um, went off the rails. The problem was, being a traditional cheese, they didn't know what they were doing. Um, tradition sounds like this wonderful thing, but it is basically what you try and remember that the last generation did. Um, without the sort of science to map it, it all goes fine as long as you carry on in the same direction. But when you change something large, like you change your milk, uh, your, your, your cow um, species or you, your, your cow um, variety, and they went from Frisian to Holstein. You change your room, you change lots of different things. Suddenly, everything shifted and you, you can't get back to what you were doing because he didn't record things before. Um, the fundamental, there, there was these nine or so things that we found that, that, that had potentially caused this, this difficulty. The single biggest one was that the room was colder and his acidification wasn't going correctly. Now, Lancashire being a cheese that comes out of the vat when it's not acidified, and it sits in a drainer and acidifies in the drainer. The vat was fine. It was jacketed, and you could get it to the correct temperature. The drainer wasn't. And there was no temperature recording in the drainer because the significance of that hadn't been understood. And in the old dairy for 30 years, it had never been an issue because the old dairy was really pokey, closed, and, and very, very warm. The idea of... The idea of um, what happened to, to Graham made me think about that relationship between tradition, between artisan, and between the science. Um, and we've been talking about science a lot. And I've been thinking about how much of what has been talked about in this room is directly usable by a cheesemaker tomorrow. 
I, I'm not, not saying there's anything wrong with it. I think it's brilliant because the more we find out. But at some point, it has to be translated into day-to-day -day stuff that a cheesemaker can use. Can I just ask how many cheesemakers in this room, people who actually themselves make the cheese, not people who employ other people to make the cheese? So a goodly number. But to think about the huge array of science that's been presented and then to think about what you can actually do tomorrow when you're, or the day after, if you have a day off, um, um, when you're over the vat. I mean, I think that's, that's a really relevant thing. And thinking about Graham with his problems, he didn't, he didn't want to know about the name of Pseudomonas, which was causing a problem. He just wanted to know what to do about it. He wanted the basic information to get him back on track. And I think that's one of the dangers of the split between science and artisan is that we need to be aware that we have to translate the research and the high-tech stuff into something that's usable for a cheesemaker. And going back to that idea of tradition, and, and I, th I think about this a lot because I've witnessed the change in Britain's traditional cheeses over the past 35 years that I've been dealing with them. So we think about traditional cheddar or traditional Lancashire as this thing that is fixed. It never was fixed and it isn't now. Traditional cheddar's changed in the last 30 years quite significantly. Traditional Lancashire changed when Graham moved his room, moved his cheesemaking room. Um, because Graham couldn't articulate what it was that he was doing, it's very easy for a young scientist with very little experience of cheesemaking to go in and dominate that situation and feel that they're dealing with somebody who doesn't actually know what they're talking about. And the respect for the artisan, I think, is something that we, we need to build into this whole way that we're thinking about things. I think the science is great. I'm not sort of being negative about any of the science, I think the, the, the tools available are huge. But then the application of them, the respect for the artisan needs to be huge too. Just because somebody doesn't thoroughly understand pH, but again, sorry, I'll, I'll, I'll tell Graham I'm, I'm using him <laughs> later. But Graham has this sense of, of the curd moving on. He doesn't talk about pH, he talks about the, the curd mo moving on. He talks about the texture of the curd, he talks about it being pulley. He is more in touch with the evolution of acidity in his cheese. He uses a, a, a titratable acidity um, only because he's been forced to do it. And he writes it down. And it doesn't really mean anything to him. What he's looking at is the texture and what his mother did and what his grandmother did and the smell of it. And he knows when it's going off track. I'm not saying that he shouldn't record the, 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 the acidity because it's really use, well, it's required and it's really useful if, if, if things go off track. You can, you've got another reference point, but the fundamental driving point of what he's doing is his sense, senses, and we need to respect that. We need to understand it. Although the, 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 the why it's not scientific is perhaps because it's just not recordable. It's a very useful tool, but you can't write down the number. That, it brings me on then to a huge change that happened in cheesemaking in this country over, of, of 20 years, which was the, the, the advent of fear in, in the process. Uh, it happened in this country in a very brutal and, and, and startling way with salmonella and eggs, with listeria and lots of things. And the late 80s, early 90s, it was a very frightening time because suddenly everybody had been going along doing what they'd done for years and, and suddenly everything changed. The, the fear element that came in was, as I say, was, was, was very debilitating um, because there was this sense of, of losing control of, of you know, your, 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 your livelihood. Um, we've worked as a, as a group um, very hard over the last 20 years to change that. And I just wanted to sort of bring this up because I know that, Kathy, yesterday you were talking about what, what's happening in the States and it, it echoed so much with what was happening to us about 20 years ago. Um, the, the, our first response, 
uh, as, a, as a cheesemaker sort of hastily banded together back then. We, we, we called ourselves the Specialist Cheesemakers Association because I was giving an interview to a newspaper about things and they said, who are you? And I said, um, with this association. And then we formed it over the weekend. <laughs> that, that's how we started. Um, but we needed to have a voice to government, but our, our initial um, way of dealing with it was actually to be quite combative, very defensive, very scared, and we talked to MPs in the press. So everything was very loud, and um, we didn't seem to get anywhere. And it was only when we, we, um, we teamed up with the Provisions Trade Federation, and, and Claire is here, and Claire just said, look, you're just going about this the wrong way. By making it all loud and, and, and difficult, you're not uh, enabling the people within the ministries to actually help you. So it's just a question of targeting the right people, doing it much more quietly, and fundamentally changing the whole attitude from being defensive, aggressive, and being cooperative. And on the whole, that's seen us through enormously well. Um, the other side of it, which is exactly what you were saying, Cathy, is, is get your ducks in a row, understand what's going on with your processes, so that you know and you're confident of what you're doing, and you can present yourself in a different light to the enforcement officer. I have to say that our enforcement officers don't carry guns. So it's more easy and it's kind of more relaxing than it seems to be in the States. I know, I know there's some enforcement officers here I was talking to yesterday, <coughs> Doug and Nigel, who would really like to have guns. <laughs> <laughs> but um, we have a really cooperative um, um, relationship on the whole with enforcement officers, with government and everything else. It helps that we're a smaller country. The Food Standards Agency is two blocks away from my shop. A lot of the people who work in the offices come and get their cheese from me. It, it, it changes everything when you have a face-to-face -face, uh, relationship with people and when they're eating the product. Get them eating raw milk cheese. And I remember the first head of the Food Standards Agency, uh, now Lord Krebs, who is a scientist and an eminent scientist, he could taste the difference between raw milk cheese and pasteurized and he preferred one of them. Um, getting your ducks in a row, we, the, um, the end product specifications, I think, that, that came from Canada that you, you were showing, we will, came out of, over here, came out in 93 um, with the first EC directive. So we've been working to those sorts of end product specs for a long time. We've then, with the SCA, set those up, um, evolved our own version of it um, to a slightly different standard, slightly tighter spec as a sort of advisory from, from, from the um, SCA. And we have our own code of best practice. Um, we've also got our, our, a really good technical team that is exactly the same as what you're doing over there. And, and, and they're all here and, and they've all served a huge number of cheesemakers enormously well, particularly Paul Neves, who's luckily regarded by most, including the government, as the, a, a very eminent um, um, dairy microbiologist, and he has trained a huge number of enforcement officers. So enforcement officers over here, a large number of them, are trained in cheesemaking and understanding raw milk cheese versus pasteurized cheese and various critical control points within. So we've been really proactive, and the latest thing that we've done um, over the past few years is set up um, um, uh, an audit system um, under the auspices of SALSA, but it's a SALSA SCA audit. It's a specific cheese audit with specific cheese auditors. So we're sort of in a position where we can say, if an enforcement officer comes, this is my system. We would say, um, We've done this swabbing ourselves. We found listeria in the drains two months ago. We took a corrective action of doing this, 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 and this. And on the whole, that's what the enforcement officer wants to hear. Um, and I always, I always think it's, it's, almost, it's more powerful to admit the issues that you've had and how you dealt with them than to say, oh, we have no, had no problems. Um, in fact, more of the, 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 the problem for us has come from large companies buying rather than from government enforcement. So large companies, supermarkets, I know you're here. 
and you're the good guys. But some of them, <laughs> some of them have been more problematic because they'll come in trying to protect the supermarket by putting the onus on the supplier to do this, 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 and this. And if they're going to large-scale factories and then they're suddenly going to a small cheese producer, it's a very different world for them to have to interact with. And that transition is sometimes very problematic. Um, and some of them, certainly uh, personally, my company, Neil's Yard Dairies, had issues with some of our customers accepting salsa. Um, so they want to do their own audit on top of our own audit, which to me, it, it, you know, it's like Ivan was saying, there are a limited number of people in the organization. Small cheese makers are not very full of employees. So what do you want the cheese maker to be doing? Filling out another audit, dealing with another audit, or making sure that the milk going to the vat's right and that the, everything's going well with the cheese maker. And the less paperwork they have to do and the more attention they can spend on the cheese, the better. So we've been sort of struggling over the past few years with, with that sort of thing but less so with the government, more so with the big companies. Um, I'm off the track. Oh yeah, I just wanted to completely other random points. Um, milk analysis. I'm really thrilled to know more about the microbiology about, of Stitchford and cheese. At the same time, we've always known, and I think people have known for years, there's a stickier coat and a drier coat and a redder coat and a whiter coat. There are things that we've, we can find out about the coats without actually knowing the names of the bugs. So all I'm saying, I'm not saying it's an either or thing. It's back to that thing of the, my concern is once, once, you hand the, once the artisan hands the responsibility of the knowledge of their product to the scientists, then we've lost. What, what the knowledge needs to do is to build the uh, armory of the, of the artisan to be able to make their cheese better. And I think that possibly the most important bit of this is understanding your milk. And we all get our milk tested. Um, I don't know if I've paid a huge amount of attention to somatic cell count. There's TBC, which I don't know if it should be low or high. That I don't want any pathogens, which is clear. But that, when that happens, when there's a pathogen, it's too late. I don't want it there. So what else am I analyzing the milk on? And this idea of having a relationship between the total bacterial count and coliform or, or something like that is, is far more, um, it, it makes me far more excited about it. But there's a fundamental, really simple thing that we can do every day. And I've been making cheese on a tiny 10-litre, 20-litre scale for the past year and a half. Buying milk from a, a neighbouring farm that um, milks 60 cows. And making cheese on the whole with no starter at all. Homegrown starter. But the milk, when we get it, we put a little pot in at 30 degrees, a little pot in at 21.5 degrees water bath and we will look at those over the course of the next day. So the cheese making's going on and the milk's fermenting. And as that milk ferments, you can look at the milk. And the 30 degree one happens quicker, obviously, and you can get an idea of what the milk was like. When there's a change in feed, when there's a change of the cows coming in and out, which this year they've been doing like that, we can pick that up in the milk really, really quickly. Not instead of testing the microbiology, as well as but the microbiology is the insurance policy. We've got, I've insured the house, but I'm also going to clean the gutters and, and make sure I've shut the windows because I'm not relying on the insurance policy to make sure my house doesn't fall down. So understanding the milk can be a really simple, everyday, and tasty thing. And if you don't want to eat it for breakfast, there's something wrong, and maybe you shouldn't be making raw milk cheese. The, the difficulty with assessing, I'd love to have one of those machines with the flashing lights in the basement as, as well. I mean, I would say that, I'd, I'd like that. <coughs> but I've got these little glass jars, they're, little, they're from Mons actually, they're little yogurt pots with the plastic lids and they're really great. You pop the milk in them, 
I've done it with people who make cheese in their dairy, and quite often it's part of the process. I've done the TA, I've done the pH, and I go over and I sniff and it's fine. Sitting down at table with it makes it food. And you interact with it in a totally different way. And you're thinking about it. It's so difficult to analyze using your own senses. Cheese grading is a nightmare of an activity. I've done it for a long time, and it's pinning down. I, I read through my old cheese. I've written down all my cheese grading notes since 1992, and I went through them the other day. They're utterly meaningless. <laughs> um, I know they were useful on the day, but recording that sort of information is, is hideously difficult. And having the confidence in, that, in, in taste is immensely difficult. So when you're starting, I remember my first, don't tell Jamie this, my first cheddar grading at, at Mendip Foods when, when all the cheddar was sent to one central place, I can remember just going around and tasting different farms, different days, time and time again, and feeling I hadn't got a clue what was going on. How am I going to learn this? And all I did was just keep going. And then after a few months or a year, I can't remember how long, there's this sense of actually I'm picking up I'm recognizing things. That flavor I had before, that, that really went wrong. I'm not going to have that one. And so doing the same thing with your fermented milk or even, and your fresh milk as well, on a regular basis, suddenly it starts to make sense and suddenly the patterns develop. And then there are links that you can make from the milk, the fermented milk that you've done at 21 and a half or 30 degrees to the cheese that you've, you've made as well. And then you're t making those links. And it's all part of the analysis but the great thing about it is you don't send it away to somebody in a white coat. You do it yourself. And it empowers you to interact with the milk and to understand what's going on in your make. I'll say it again, as well as all the really exciting stuff that's happening in the labs. And putting those two together then has immense power. I think that's all I wanted to say. My name's Matteo Keeler, and um, my brother and I started Jasper Hill Farm. This is Jasper Hill. Um, we milk about 45 Ayrshire cows, and we're cheesemakers that are farming. So that's a specific uh, perspective, and it's different than a lot of the producers in our area who are farmers that are making cheese. It's, um, there's a distinction there that we recognize, and um, we milk our cows to produce a very specific type of milk to make a very specific type of cheese. And we learned how to milk cows from a vet when we started milking. We didn't know a tit from a telephone pole. And uh, we've learned to do uh, what we do by really uh, looking at the cheese and trying to celebrate uh, the place where we live. Um, we also um, ripen cheese for eight other cheesemakers. We built a, an aging facility uh, that we're essentially looking to uh, <coughs> leverage opportunities for cheesemakers in our region by lowering the barriers to entry and keeping um, our, our landscape working. So cheese for us is just a vehicle to achieve these other social goals. In order to achieve those goals, the cheese needs to be delicious and we spend a lot of energy uh, trying to understand how to do that. Uh, I'm not going to talk about uh, too much of that, but it's a pretty uh, large concern. We're the only thing like it going in the U.S. This is a cheddar vault and there's a real life caveman. Um, <laughs> What I'm going to talk about uh, today is um, how we make a very particular cheese called Winamere. It's a very high moisture, high risk cheese. Um, it's a very slow acidification. Um, and it's um, possibly one of two cheeses now in the US that are made in this style from raw milk. Um, and um, you know, it, it put a, this cheese put us on the map. Um, we, um, it's a, a lot about the texture. Um, but uh, in order to uh, produce the milk for this cheese, uh, we're really looking at a, a complete um, farm uh, ecosystem approach to controlling the microbial uh, communities 
in a way that we can be uh, confident we're not going to kill somebody out there. Because if there's one cheese in our uh, collection that's going to be problematic, it's, it's going to be this one. Um, we have instituted a lot of preventive controls. We uh, test um, uh, our milk uh, for listeria um, and E. coli on every um, uh, batch of cheese. We don't have results, obviously, till it's too late. Uh, but one, one of the things that we found and is, is that sampling milk for listeria, we've never found listeria in, in a bulk tank. Um, over uh, the course of the last few years, uh, we've had the opportunity to, um, and I call it an opportunity, because if I didn't think of it as an opportunity, um, I don't think I could get out of bed in the morning, uh, to really learn um, about a really broad uh, cross-section of, of problems. Uh, at, at, what we do at the sellers is like we buy people's problems. <laughs> Essentially, other people's problems become our own. And uh, we're really fortunate to have uh, Dr. Kathy and her lab in our backyard to help us sort through um, a lot of this stuff. Um, but uh, what's become clear to me um, is that you know, if you're looking for listeria in milk, it is really hard to find. You can have two or three cells swimming around in a, in a giant bulk tank, and the, uh, the chances of being able to dip one out uh, with a dipper it, are, are very low. So uh, we, we learned this technique from Yvonne, and what we actually uh, sample is the, the milk filter. So every batch of uh, raw milk cheese now that's coming into the cellars um, is being sampled, the, the filters are being sampled. This is part of uh, this uh, preventive control. So how do, we, how do we validate that our process is safe, that we can produce this cheese? Because uh, the ch chances are the FDA is going to want to stamp uh, this kind of product out of existence. Um, we need to demonstrate that our, our, our milk is clean, uh, unadulterated, safe, and uh, that starts for us by sampling the milk filters, um, which is basically a concentrated reservoir of all the bacteria in the milk. And that, that's something that I learned from Yvonne. It's been a hugely useful tool. So if you uh, really want to see what's in your milk, start looking at your filters. Um, I'd like, uh, the, and so we're, we're doing, you know, kind of the classic uh, raw pasteurized PI total coliform. We have quite dead milk. Um, but it turns out that it's not really dead at all because it acidifies um, quite quickly. So we, we have um, an interesting proportion of lactic acid producing that bacteria. We're able to um, make cheese without starter culture. In fact, um, uh, I remember when we, when we first started um, uh, making cheese, Randolph uh, marched around the U.S. with a piece of... Uh, constant bliss in his pocket and pretty much helped launch our business uh, in 2003, I think it was. Um, I clean my pocket first. Yeah. <laughs> um, and our, so, you know, you look at, you look at these numbers, um, where we have a pretty much a zero tolerance for Staph aureus in our herd. So we've got a two strikes in your out policy. If a cow comes down with Staph, we treat the cow. If, um, if she la uh, relapses, uh, we, we actually ship her because um, we're, um, we, have, we don't have staff in our herd and, and we're, we're really looking at keeping it that way. Um, on the other hand, there's, uh, here's another set of results um, that looks almost identical and it's from another farm. Um, and you know what? Like, what, what's the what's the difference between these these two milks? Um, you know, there's a little fat and protein compositional difference, but the milk that's produced on this farm has been the source of more problems than I can shake a stick at. Uh, we've had we've had we've had them all, but the milk sample results look exactly the same. And uh, this, I just. 
reinforces uh, what Marie Christine was uh, showing us yesterday is that it's really about um, the, re the, re the ratios of, micro uh, of the microbial community within your milk that are going to determine whether a product is edible and safe or not. Um, if you've got less than a thousand uh, bacteria but 900 of them are pseudomonas, <laughs> it's a big problem. Um, for us at this stage, um, we're uh, really interested in this idea of building uh, my, uh, a microbial uh, ecosystem um, and really uh, looking at changing some of our farm practices. Uh, but we'll probably do it on another farm. Uh, we have uh, a, a, a luxury, in a way, um, to be participating in the startup of new cheesemaking ventures in our neighborhood, and our ability to learn over time is, uh, is going to be great. We're really excited about the work that Ben and Rachel are doing because uh, we're learning a lot about uh, what's actually in our cheese, and what we add to the cheese is the little black line there, right? So, um, you know, we add uh, Danisco starters and ripening cultures, and there's none of that that's actually recovered uh, on the rind of, of the cheese, which is confusing. <laughs> and, and wonderful in a way. Um, We've also learned that we can alter these communities by uh, changing the way that we ripen the cheese. A degree Celsius completely reorients um, the composition of the dominant species uh, on that pie chart. Um, a, a degree up or a degree down will reshuffle the deck. So, um, in, in essence, you know, uh, what we have the opportunity to do now with the science that we have at hand is, um, you know, look at the sensory qualities of the cheese and uh, really map out the way that a changing environment or uh, seasonal changes in our milk um, or uh, different processing techniques or different milk supply um, affect the composition of uh, the final cheese. And it's not about, um, well, standing back and saying, well, I think um, I'm going to try and shift the pseudo alteromonas uh, uh, population just, just a little bit, uh, but really understanding what's contributing to the sensory qualities. And what, what, we've, what we're doing at the cellars is developing um, sensory tools, but at the end of the day, it comes down to how delicious is this cheese and how much more of it do I want to eat, and um, we're learning how to measure that. Um, so here is uh, a tasting star, so if you want to talk to her about um, our tasting program, she'd be a great person to check in with. Um, at the end of the day, um, as a cheesemaker, uh, standing in front of the vat, uh, a lot of what um, I'm experiencing um, I'm being lit up by this science. It's really stimulating uh, for me, and it, it's actually giving me a lot of confidence to uh, continue doing what we've been doing for the last few years. Um, intuitively, I've known that it's working, um, but this is just uh, a, a way of um, plugging in on an intellectual level uh, and building, building the understanding of products. So I'm really happy to be here and uh, to be able to participate um, in, in this program, but mostly just the, to, to the opportunity to get to talk to so many of you about, about what you're doing and learning has been a real thrill, so, so thanks.